All right, thank you very much for the many people that responded with uh, example questions. Could we put up the question slides, please? And so what I've done is not taken the uh, information you've gave, given me verbatim, but rather tried to group them. And I don't think I'm going to go through them in great detail. I've lumped them by category. Uh, the first was we have a series of questions related to genetic architecture. Some of them are obvious. That, that doesn't mean, by the way, they're not important. Um, they're obvious, and I won't review the obvious ones. We had a couple of um, people that, that suggested that we talk a little more about the role of families, and I, I've added that to this category is that as we think about how to tease apart the genetic architecture of human disease, um, we, we should consider the role of families. I think one of the most interesting uh, points uh, both for me personally and maybe for this workshop and having a, a large sample of deeply phenotyped individuals is this concept of pleiotropy that we can actually, you know, begin to understand the role of genetic variation uh, on multiple traits simultaneously in the relationship uh, among traits. For example, you know, uh, metabolic disease, obesity, metabolic disease, and cancer. I think there's some great emerging data and the role of genetic variation. In, in that relationship. Genetic modifiers, we're going to talk more about that uh, later. The second category was uh, a lot of input on, on novel drug targets. Again, Francis mentioned this idea of the human um, knockout experiment, loss of function of protective alleles. I think novel pathways, I think that's another area where identification of rare variants for human disease will give us insight into novel pathways that pharma then can use uh, as hooks for um, developing new therapeutics. Uh, the, another point is we have a number of common diseases where really we're focusing today on palliative care. And I think having information about the role of loss of function variants in, in disease, we can actually begin to have better treatments for those diseases and not just um, you know, palliative care, as I said. Oops. Pharmacogenetics, I, and I put pharmacogenetics, by the way, different from novel drug targets. Even though there's some drugs in both, obviously one is the identification of targets and the other is sort of, I, I lump it in my little head uh, as a response to treatment. So there's the obvious quantitative response to treatment. I think there's a lot of help in drug dosing. Um, my own personal interest, and I think something we could be using a lot in the, in the clinical setting is adverse outcomes. There's enormous numbers of adverse outcomes. And by linking genomic information to healthcare records, we can begin to get insight, genetic and otherwise, to the etiology of many of those outcomes. One of the things that large-scale cohort studies, one of the, their characteristics is most of them tend to be longitudinal, and, and we, they're not just a, a cross-sectional study. We're, we're collecting information and following in, individuals over time and collecting again. Uh, particularly in young people, we have a, a chance to understand normal development, and by understanding normal development, we probably have better insight than into abnormal development. For the epidemiologists in the group, the obviously we can start to begin to predict incident disease. What are the predictors of future disease? And I think that's probably very important for gene-environment interactions who don't have a confounding between disease and, and treatment. Um, again, <clears throat> Francis reminded me yesterday about the, you know, the healthcare um, overhaul bill has a large component on outcomes research. And uh, I think we can begin to understand the role of genetic variation in, in outcomes, you know, whether it be mortality, second events, uh, response to treatment, et cetera. The other um, comment that we had multiple times in, in the questions was somatic variation over time. Um, I'm not an expert in cancer, but I think we have the ability in, in large-scale longitudinal cohorts to understand the role of, of changes in the genome and how that gives rise to, to, to um, malignancies over time. Okay. <clears throat> Health disparities came up both yesterday and in the list of questions. Um, I, th I think we have an opportunity both to look at the role of genetic factors. Probably more important, though, is the role of gene-environment interaction in, in health disparities. And particularly in this country, I'm not as familiar worldwide, but there's just a growing um, economic divide in this country, and I think it's leading to larger and larger health disparities. And we have an opportunity with large-scale cohort studies to better understand the role of genetic factors in gene environment interaction 
in health disparities. Then epigenetics, I, I lump, for, apologies for the experts in the audience, I lumped together epigenetic uh, changes and somatic variation into one category here, probably wrongly. Uh, we can look at the role of both in disease severity, particularly late onset diseases, um, the role of environmental influence on both epigenetics and somatic variation, changes in life course. Um, I think Steve did a nice job in, in talking about the up upcoming ONCODE papers, is looking at the, the multiple dimensions or new dimensions really of the human genome. And we can look at changes in the genome across the life course. Obviously, the, there's changes when we think about somatic variation, there's changes among tissues. And, and I think it's going to be very interesting and, cha and very challenging, by the way, as I spend an inordinate amount of time in my office, with people interested in methylation and the like. In humans, we pretty much have access to tissues that people slough off normally um, with maybe a needle, the help of a needle. You know, you're not going to get liver, you're not going to get brain biopsies on, on normal free-living people. And we've got to figure out how to, to, to um, push this field um, with the tissues that we have access to. Um, the role of, obviously, in somatic variation, mosaicism is going to be very important so we can detect it with at least today's technologies. Then finally, um, I think it's finally, one of the things I think we're all struggling with as we move from exomes to genomes is the challenge of annotating the whole genome. And I would predict, both in humans and the mouse, that having large samples of deeply phenotyped individuals is actually going to help us with that annotation. We can look at the role of conserved regions, the role of hypervariable regions, um, such as the olfactory genes, and relate them to phenotype, distant regulatory regions, begin to try to map uh, transposable elements in virus insertion sites and look at the, the role of those in, in human disease, and then to begin the, the task of assigning function to unknown motifs because variation in those motifs, naturally occurring genetic variation in those motifs are leading to phenotypic or disease variation. And uh, which I think, I think this one's actually very exciting for the basic science side of me, that uh, we have a huge challenge annotating whole genomes today. And I think actually having a data resource like this is gonna help push the field. So this was a, a glimpse of what you all sent me. I apologize, I did not assign a name to each individual because I would get it wrong, <clears throat> but I will circulate this immediately to the whole group, and if people can basically edit, add to, comment, you know, this is ridiculous, Eric, come on, you know, play it, and then send it back to me. If you do the ridiculous thing, just send it back to me. Uh, um, and then we'll, we'll begin to work this. My guess, The final document will need to address um, what are the potential questions or use case scenarios. And, okay, comments? I will, yep. Great. And Stephen and Thomas, I'm going to turn it over to you.